delivery management is set up as a directive PMO under the uh, PMI definitions. And what that means is um, we have full accountability for the delivery of the work and the leadership of the workforce that undertake uh, the capital program. So in this sense, the project managers are part of the PMO, so they're not a separate uh, entity. So they coordinate and lead all of the activities. So we really do look at it as being project manager and project centric. As a group, through the asset creation process, we deliver something like um, uh, 1,500 projects are in flight at any one particular time. So delivery management's task, therefore, is to design, construct, and then commission uh, projects with an intent that maintains its connection through to the overall business strategy. Um, and the business strategy for Sydney Water at the moment is, um, you know, the, the challenge that we see is that, um, you know, as a city, Sydney is growing, and it's growing really rapidly. Um, about an extra one and a half million people are going to be moving into Sydney over the next decade. And so to cope with you know, 150,000 new customers per year is a huge challenge and a stretch on not just the resources of our business, but also the supply chain. As a part of a view in terms of how to, uh, to cope with that huge increase in, um, in work, um, you know, we've seen over the last five years, the, the scale of the capital program has grown from the team delivering something in 250 to 300 million dollars a year to this year delivering 700 million dollars uh, and to next year we're looking at over a billion dollars worth of infrastructure so it's been a huge ramp up in terms of the work delivery management has been on a journey since uh, 2013. I remember when uh, I said to Mark you don't really want to do a survey do you I think we know the answer let's just start uh, working together and fix this and he said no I want to do a survey because not everyone uh, really understands the state of the, the state of play the state of the relationship so I want to do a survey and uh, and and get that feedback and start that as a as a cadence so we can watch ourselves move but first I've got to convince everyone that there's a problem uh, so we did a survey and uh, it was 5% of the, the uh, respondents said that the uh, delivery management were doing an okay job. Um, and, uh, and most of the others were, I don't want them on site again and uh, can we find somewhere else? And um, it, was quite a, it, was it was quite a fractured relationship. Uh, we have definitely been on a massive journey. Um, I know that if you go back, say, three years, um, we did not have Power BI dashboards. So the review side of things was very basic. Uh, it was effectively spreadsheets, which were never really um, that good an option to begin with. Um, in terms of the do, uh, everything was very um, personalized to the project manager. Uh, so we would have issues whereby if you had a project manager delivering a project and he had all of his correspondence and all of his, uh, you know, manual workflow tasks were sitting in his inbox. Uh, when he left, you would lose a lot of that information. And uh, the next project manager was obviously going to struggle to get on top of the project. So, so we started that off in 2013 with the Enable and Optimize um, uh, initiative. And basically, we looked to initially stabilize the team. Uh, and then align the team in terms of understanding the, uh, the business, the processes that we have in place, and really start to prepare the business for, um, for the change that's to come. We made sure that there was a strong alignment with City Water's objectives, and we looked to embed uh, a new organ organisation structure within the PMO, um, a program office, uh, whereby we established uh, a centre of excellence, and the Centre of Excellence for providing all of the service and the support that's required um, for the project managers to perform as a, as a function. The next step was to enable and optimise. So we really did work on the, um, the uplift of our people capability. So this, uh, a lot of effort went into clarifying the roles, not only for the PMs and the PEs, but for the full Centre of Excellence. Um, we did work to get the team organisation and roles in place that really supported our overall project delivery methodology. So we really worked hard to define the business processes over this time and get in place a, a management system that would effectively support how project delivery operates. So you know, a, you know, a great deal of effort was put into training uh, the guys in terms of um, a lot of them were accidental project managers and we wanted to take these guys through to developing themselves 
as a project management and leadership cohort. Um, and a lot of the training took, a, took the point of not only having our existing pro business processes and following quite a standard approach, we took um, a way to try and make it dynamic and interesting, so a lot of gamification. Um, uh, so, for, for example, we conducted a, uh, an exercise called the battle, and which basically took all of the teams through to, uh, to try and educate them in terms of what it means to be, instead of being a project manager that does everything, how do you understand that you need to lean out and reach out and engage a wider team? The comms person does the comms, the procurement person does the procurement, uh, and really create an environment like that. So the battle was a terrific example of how that really engaged and took the team through in a, a new way of working. I guess the most outstanding um, aspects of um, the journey uh, that delivery management has been through over the last, um, well, since 2013, is uh, the wonderful way that the people have evolved and the business has changed. Um, to see um, a, a lot of our employees that were very fixed and, um, I guess, change um, fatigued, uh, shall we say, and seeing how with our different innovative ways of um, creating the change um, and training up our new people um, as well as our, a lot of our existing ones, um, it's been amazing to see the evolution and the change in the business um, that delivery management has managed to achieve. We also worked for um, towards the end of 2018 on um, leadership development. So um, we really wanted to be able to see how um, the team leaders, you know, once we had the structure in place and uh, the, r the right commercial framework, we wanted to help our leaders in terms of being able to take their people through what is a new period of change uh, and uh, an advance in how we're operating. So again, uh, leadership development for project managers and senior leaders has, um, has really aligned the culture. And, uh, and again, allowed them to give them the, the tools and the capability and the, um, I think the, um, the confidence to be able to lead their teams through what is a, an intense period of change. Because all of this over the last five years has been a continual change. There's no chance that it's sat and waited uh, to see how things are, um, are running. It's always a constant uh, development. So there's something constant, continually looking over the horizon and all the team members are thinking about how can we advance, how can we develop and take things forwards. And having a look at the wide interest that that has created within, um, within industry um, is absolutely amazing to see how many people do actually want to come and work with um, City Water and Delivery Management now. It's absolutely fantastic. Comments also like, from individuals, for example, that were, um, yeah, very negative and hesitant previously um, to see how they've come on board. And um, it's kind of like an aha moment as well when they actually acknowledge and say, you know, it, what you've done is actually not too bad. Uh, how do we do it? And then the final part has been recently in 2019 uh, going into this year has been about um, the extension. So we've really moved, uh, we're moving away from the focus on internal improvement because we feel that's going very, very well. And we're really looking at the um, external focus um, and how we're going to be partnering with the supply chain at a much greater level, uh, really getting integrated teams to come and work together and make sure that the supply chain is um, an integral part of our delivery. So, so the level of maturity keeps growing and they keep working on it and, uh, and we keep working on it together. And uh, the goals have been set in terms of uh, cost to serve, looking after customers, quality, um, relationships at each site. The successful project, project isn't one where you've just delivered the stuff. Uh, it's actually one where it's been sustained, positive relationships, both sides of the party see, that, see and feel that they've done a great job. The cost of the, the job was uh, delivered as planned or better and the quality is fantastic and, uh, and we're ready to do the next one in a positive way. We're certainly um, up towards that end of the spectrum now, which has uh, been a long journey, a different one, but um, we're in a much better place than we were, of course. So the way we um, the way we structure delivery management, um, it basically has our project managers um, in uh, at their regionally based um, groups, so north, south, and west, and then we have what we call our centre of excellence, which is basically all the supporting functions that support the project managers in delivering their works in a matrix type of a structure. Um, it um, it has proven to be a very sophisticated way of having. Uh, 
subject matter experts focusing on their tasks that they're good on and repeating their tasks in a repeatable manner. This also allows us to... Um, continually improve and identify improvements when you have uh, very specific, um, I guess, functional uh, teams focusing on what they're actually um, experts in. Um, so in, a, in the matrix type of a structure, whereas previously we had project managers being um, schedulers, estimators, and, um, you know, they were doing a little bit of contract management. They were doing a bit of comms themselves and, um, you know, they were jack of all trade. We've actually removed those um, functional um, SMEs and components out of their works and getting them to uh, focus purely on that project management perspective. Um, Allowing them to get assistance from uh, a lot of the SMEs in that centre of excellence, um, that, again, was a cultural shift because a lot of our guys saw that a little bit of uh, uncomfortable power loss. Um, it was something that they had total control of and they did, um, and now somebody else is doing that aspect of their work. Uh, that came together with, um, I guess, a bit of planning, uh, but also a, a bit of time and a bit of luck. Um, so from a planning perspective, um, the way that we developed our MOS and we created um, service level agreements between all of the functional SME areas and the project managers. So the project managers were very, very clear and assured on what they were going to get delivered by when. So they weren't going to be delayed, for example, by um, the estimator not creating their estimate on time. Um, and then we actually tracked and managed our individuals um, to those SLAs. So on a monthly basis, uh, we would know how many of our people were meeting their targets uh, and the deliverables that, for example, the project managers were expecting. So I guess after a little bit of while, um, that gave the project managers assurance that, you know, hold on a second, this could actually work because, you know, our friends that are sitting next to us now are delivering what they say they're going to deliver. They amazingly have a greater capability and capacity to deliver it because that is what they're focusing on. They're giving us ideas of improvements along the way of how we can do things better to the way we were doing it. Um, and they're getting monitored um, that they are delivering the quality and they're delivering to time. So it started building that confidence and assurance and uh, title relationships across this matrix structure um, with the um, project managers and the centre of excellence functions um, as we moved along. Everyone in the centre of excellence recognised what they needed to do to make project delivery successful. The, the schedulers would have a, a plan about how quickly they needed to be able to review the level of accuracy that they needed to put into any review of projects, how they would work to support project managers in terms of reviewing contractual uh, deliverables. The estimating team, they would know, um, because everything's built into a, a prime schedule so that everything runs off a core schedule for the team, every team member and centre of excellence team member know when they're expected to go and do their piece of work. Um, so estimators know when they've got a big bulk and a large project coming up, they know to be prepared and ready to go and undertake that work. And that means they can then stick to their service level agreement of turning around estimates within a certain level of accuracy uh, and within a certain time scale. So it really did tighten up. The other interesting aspect um, of uh, the way that we're structured is the regional um, uh, structure that we have. So one of the other challenges, I guess, in my role is, you know, I had, for example, a safety team in the south, a safety team in the north and a safety team in the west. And it was eliminating the what I used to uh, say to my staff is, I don't want you to go native. So it was how do we gain that consistency? How do we actually pull those regions together and gain consistency across all three? By no means did we want to clone all three and by no means did we want to hinder progress and innovation. Um, but the beauty of what we actually saw started happening within the teams is they started sharing. So, for example, if the South developed something um, that was... Uh, helping their safety stats and improving the well-being of their people. Uh, then we had the opportunity to bring the team back together to the central um, hub and actually share that learning and actually inc include the other two regions um, and uplift them in those areas. So this, the delivery management structure, really does have a, a high-performance culture built into it. So the, um, there is a passion and desire in terms of how the team operates and work. Uh, but it's very collaborative, so it's not just an owner team sitting there dictating how things should operate. We're working really closely with the supply chain. 
And so suppliers, uh, consultants and contractors are embedded with us to work in a, in a true spirit of open collaboration and cooperation. In terms of our business operation, our asset creation process, we took, a, we took an approach to project delivery that really did align to what we considered to be best practice was um, PMBOK. Uh, so that's the core fundamental of how our project delivery um, process is in place. When it comes down to estimating, uh, again, the um, RICS and uh, um, Australian Institute of Quantity Surveying, we take those sort of approaches and we really do engage heavily with uh, external professional bodies to try to see where latest trends and latest developments are and to make sure that we're not trying to reinvent the wheel, that we're actually trying to utilise best practice opportunities that are out there and embed those into our organisation. So whether it be how you do estimating, whether it be how you do undertake your procurement exercise, whether it's the project delivery processes that we use, or um, where we're going to now in terms of engaging with our customers. Uh, for instance, uh, Senior Water Delivery Portal, it's one of our primary systems that we use. Uh, we use that as a project management tool. So people log in, log on every day to check on all the work. Uh, it has a lot of functionality such as raising site diaries, um, issue work to proceed form uh, whenever a, a, a mobilize, mobilization is required. So that sort of ties into um, the process that, that we have in Helix. Uh, it's just a checkpoint making sure the PM is doing, doing the right thing at the right time. I'd have to say that the thing that I'm most proud of is uh, that end-to-end -end, um, solidification of process uh, right through to the applications and the workflows that we've created from first principles to, to get our people through those processes as accurately and effectively and as transparently as possible, um, right through to that um, the amazing visibility via our Power BI dashboards that just gives management that ability to make those educated decisions. Basically, we're using Prime of our P6, EPPM, and uh, P6 Professional in order to perform our uh, project management functionality. Um, and it is across capital infrastructure projects within Sydney Water. Um, scheduling team is a, is a function within delivery management, which is going beyond delivery management and we expanded our services to the wider group as well. That helps us to ensure we cover the project throughout the life cycle right from when they're accepted as a candidate uh, throughout the various stage gateways in asset creation process. So we have developed a document that we call it schedule requirement. That helps us to ensure that we have got a consistency across our supply chain and also we ensure that we standardize our requirements so our contractors really will know what we expect from them in terms of the program and the schedule. And we make sure that we review the program consistently um, across different portfolios and also across different regions that we have got. Um, we have also resource and cost loaded our schedule, um, which has lifted Prime Aura P6 to an enterprise system and solution for resource demand planning. Uh, we have used Power BI in order to plot the resource requirements, and then we brought in the estimate to complete of the project um, from P6. And also, we have topped that one up with our capital invest infrastructure and capital investment program figures. So the combination of all this enables us to, met, to look into the resource requirements with respect and, and taking account of the money that we have got. Yeah. And if required, then we can go back and adjust our resource demand requirements based on what fund we have got in our hand so we can invest on the projects. Uh, we being in the estimation and we will price job in such a way so that it is uh, uh, it's appropriately priced uh, having a market coverage and it gives a confidence to Sydney Water and the stakeholder and when the project is being built uh, it will be within the budget and within the time frame and that is the optimized costing what we are doing allowing various factors of safety and environment also and the community uh, consideration.
uh, we have got the uh, estimation manual and the processes in place in the Helix, and we try to adhere to that. And we have got a couple of cold points where we do the costing, we incorporate or incorporate all the uh, necessary information before we kicking off the costing, and we involve uh, the expert stakeholders or uh, resources within the organization to <clears throat> have their views in the costing like as for example, the construction methodology that we used to consult project engineer or even design engineers and at times uh, construction superintendent. Those people are absolutely on a site and that helps us a lot to provide us appropriately costing. And the estimation will be more finer and it's pretty much more likely scenario. That's what we try to do that. We involve uh, other stakeholders like comms, like Enviro guys, like uh, uh, construction uh, design engineers, uh, project managers, uh, and that that will help us a lot. And uh, that will be challenged uh, from various angles. Being an estimator, I don't know the side reality of Enviro or the comms issues. Uh, so they will come out with that and they will flag up their uh, points and that will incorporate into uh, uh, risk register. And that could be an opportunity also. Uh, so it's not only the race, it could be an opportunity. So if we capture that and we run through uh, Monte Carlo at risk model and we'll come out with uh, P50, P80 numbers. And that's again, the, uh, the numbers goes to the stakeholders. They will again review. Again, we, if required, we will have the uh, second round of uh, workshop. And that's how you know, the risk and opportunity is captured uh, very well and pretty much in depth. Uh, for us, best practice means we have become really efficient in terms of how we do things. We've become very much more collaborative and we've become a lot more transparent. So what that means is from an efficiency perspective, we've moved a lot towards direct negotiations. So that, that for us from a procurement perspective cuts out a lot of time in terms of tendering and not having to go to the market each time. We've become collaborative. We've got an integrated team. We have a team that sits in along with the rest of delivery management and they and we work together. We are on the same floor. We can talk to each other. We can just go around and have a chat if we need to get things resolved. We take a much more, NEC4 allows for a much more collaborative approach. You can sit down, you can have a discussion, you can decide yeah, how it goes. And because it's been written in plain English, People who wrote it know how it was written. The second thing in those contracts is that they are flexible. So the scope of a project changes, you change the contract. If, the, if you need more time to do a project, you change the contract as you go along. Other contracts like the GC21 or uh, the FIDIC don't really give you that sort of ability to vary the contract as you go along and for it to be done by the project managers. So that data is all captured within SW Delivery Portal, and then the raw data itself is exported into our Power BI reports. And from there, you can get that um, macro level understanding at a glance of which contractors are performing uh, better or worse, uh, knowing the breakup of, well, how much of their incidents are health and safety versus environment versus community relations, quality, et cetera. We've got about 10 different categories for which we assess those report actions. Um, and so from there, you can zoom right in. So if you wanted to focus on just one contractor or one type of incident over all of our contractors, you can then consider, okay, well, what is our highest health and safety incident that keeps occurring? and then focus our attention on that. Continuous improvement mechanisms will build into this as well. So the plan, do, check, act um, approach. Um, checkpoints will build into the uh, service level agreements. So again, so we can monitor and see where tweaks need to be made in our process and in terms of how the teams are operating. If project managers are seeing um, concerns or issues, they can raise that effectively with the, uh, the leaders of the teams and they can work on how their teams are functioning. So it's been a it's it's really been useful in terms of being able to create an open environment where there can be some really good robust but um, I think um, um, clear discussions about how things can be improved without people feeling offended or being um, uh, feeling too challenged. 
it's about an area where we can all see openly about how things are performing and whether we all need to work together to take things forwards. Uh, so I think for us, um, it, pu it puts a framework around how we operate. So uh, we might implement um, a new workflow and then perhaps two years down the track, we find that the business has evolved and we might need to change that slightly. So um, that is part of the way that we operate. We, we um, will have a review on uh, whether it be uh, types of inspections that we perform or um, how, a, how a specific uh, workflow functions. Um, we'll try and evolve that in line with how the business is operating. The MOS uh, has that inbuilt cycle of renewal within it. So uh, as, as we said, it's the plan, resource, do, uh, review and act cycle. So if, it, if we weren't consistently getting to that review and then act on the learnings, um, we probably wouldn't have um, reached this level of best practice and we probably wouldn't have that driver to continue to try new things. I mean... So innovation is, um, is something that's really key to us not only being able to perform effectively and um, to to be an efficient and effective delivery organisation, but it's also something that um, maintains a level of uh, excitement and engagement through the team. Um, innovations quite often they can be um, either centre led or dictated, um, but we like to create an environment where everyone's got the opportunity to 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 think where something could change or something could be made better and they get the opportunity to feed that back in. You know, breaking up our structure in the regional um, format and also the centre of excellence matrix structure um, over the last, um, I guess, few years has um, proved to be um, a lot more um, innovative, a lot more, um, I guess, progressive uh, in a cultural aspect relationship based um, and has phenomenally increased our performance um, over the last few years. We look at the opportunity to give um, innovations that get brought back um, from each of the regions to the centre. So, for example, um, one of our regions was um, was very keen to get, to get into digital engineering, to really try to, uh, to start to utilise um, BIM modelling for the development of some of their um, designs and models. We recognise that the, we had similar projects happening in the other regions, and so we were able to take some of the initial learnings from um, using digital engineering within one region and replicate that very rapidly around the other regions. So it really did give the opportunity to accelerate our learning and delivery approaches. For the global procurement strategy, it was a, a huge innovation for, um, for the business and for a government organisation to take its pathway down. Originally, the commercial model for the... Um, for the program was that every individual project needed to be bidded by uh, teams that had come together as a panel of contractors. Um, hugely inefficient um, and very traditional, I think, in terms of the way of thinking that the best way to deliver a project is the lowest price. We got to a position of determining uh, if we get a great price and we get great performance, we're going to continue working with you. So the global procurement strategy was put in place to really uh, provide a focus on excellence, excellence in contracting performance and excellence in pricing. Uh, and instead of everything working its way through um, having to be uh, go to tender and, and be bid, even though they were incumbent teams, even though they were already on a panel that they'd fought to get onto, they still had to bid every project. We took that away and said that about 80% of our work now is um, is direct negotiation. So the teams that are incumbent within a region, we monitor their performance through KPIs on a daily basis. Um, team members, and this is a, another innovation, is that the entire KPI regime is primarily centred on uh, lead indicators as opposed to lag indicators. So how you've performed is interesting, but really we're looking at trying to hedge off and push away any potential issues early on. So, the, uh, so that global procurement strategy, uh, it was a challenge, um, getting that through with Treasury and uh, our own internal governance, um, because again, still the mindset was there that you need those three prices to make sure you're getting the best price. Uh, and we've taken it into that 
position now where people understand it's about value. Uh, so the price is one aspect and we've got a really good pricing database anyway. So we can do the own internal challenge against the suppliers. Um, but we really take a, a holistic view about what does value mean for us from every one of our individual projects. Innovation uh, in terms of training development um, is, a, again, is another cornerstone of how we really do encourage the environment to be one of um, a dynamic interaction and entertainment. We want people to enjoy their work. You know, you're only here once, so let's make it a good time. Uh, so how can we recognize we've got an important service to provide? Let's make sure that we're enjoying the work while we're doing it. And especially training is a real key area because people love to train. People love to be educated and love to um, have the opportunity to develop themselves. There's nothing worse than when training is delivered in a basic monotone and um, quite a lot of it, you know, death by PowerPoint type of uh, approach. So we try to... Um, in terms of developing people in terms of how our business processes operate and how our management operating system uh, functions by gamifying our learning so whether it's a case of teaching everyone how the project delivery processes work by using um, uh, the battle was uh, an approach that took everyone through their roles and responsibilities or whether we move to something that's teaching people how a management operating system works and when you need to do your plan do check out cycle um, by using uh, Le Brouhaha or Game of Moans, were two great um, gamification simulations that we used that really took people out of their existing world uh, and got them into a bit of a fun environment that was totally uh, related to what the re their uh, real world of work is, but in a, a, a much more dynamic and entertaining way of doing it. Uh, and you know, the uplift that we've seen in terms of people's capability and desire and interest and willingness to, uh, to, to use our new ways of working has been directly attributable to that way of um, educating and learning. Which doesn't leave a way that we don't do the 70 to 2010 uh, approach to learning as well. So most of it is on the job. 20% is by coaching and 10% is by um, formal training. I guess that inspiration that, oh my gosh, this is a fun place. You know, it's not going to be just another boring, laborious three hour training session that we have to sit through, follow the bouncing ball to understand what we're doing. It was, uh, you know, they had involvement in it. Um, they enjoyed it. Um, and at the end of the day, it, it's things, it's the little things like that that have stuck and have created that fun, um, innovative culture. And there's, you know, there's, there are a wider, um, degree of influences that we that we do take um, you know we're not sat isolated from wider industry and other organizations we do take a put a lot of effort into reaching out to see where latest developments and innovations and best practices can come from so we let um, engage heavily with the um, with the UK with the Institute of Civil Engineers a major projects association for example um, where even though we were recognised by major projects as a, an exemplar model for capital delivery, we did also engage with them with the, um, a group within the Institute of Civil Engineers called Project 13. And Project 13 is really um, uh, an industry movement and initiative looking to establish what is the ideal framework or what is the best approach for um, infrastructure organisations to structure their commercial uh, business structure their delivery frameworks uh, and have in place their um, in-house teams working with uh, the supply chain to best effect um, delivery of infrastructure. So it's been fantastic seeing and managing to work through and take a team forwards in terms of moving away from your old state traditional ways and coming forward into a world that's more dynamic, more engaging, a lot more fun to be in. I'm surprised time and time again, actually, about um, the engagement scores that delivery management has compared to the rest of Sydney Water. Without a doubt, they're, they're just, um, they're through the roof. Um, and I got today's latest ones and saw that they were up around 80, 90%. So they're definitely doing something correct. But then we've got the right mechanisms in play as well for, for true engagement. So that's not only information coming from the top down, but it's coming from the bottom up. 
What I mean by that is we have a lot of mechanisms and channels in place. We've got Team Talk, which is about teams getting together on a monthly basis to ensure that they've got the information that they need, but they can also have access to the questions that they want. Uh, we've got Quarterly Connections, which is about um, our uh, permanent staff and also our supply chain coming together and um, learning from each other, um, understanding what the priorities are on both sides and actually, I guess, promoting innovation from that and sharing new ideas as well. And we've got things like the performance action meetings. So they um, are where our suppliers and our supply chain come in and they talk through basically, you know, the challenges they're facing, but also the opportunities that they've uncovered and they share those across the regions. So really you've got this, uh, I guess, a whole of, uh, of organisation focus, which is really driving best practice and outcomes for our customers. So we kind of put in a fair bit of effort um, in trying to um, get the cultural shift within the team. Um, you know, when we first commenced on our journey in 2013, we had individuals um, sitting on the same level at desks next to each other, for example, that didn't even know each other's names. Um, so through a lot of, um, I guess, plan targeted and identified efforts um, to make it a fun place to work, number one, to get people to know each other um, on a work and a social type of a basis, um, to get individuals to understand what other functions and groups within delivery management were doing. So that exposure um, and a lot of those activities that we kind of orchestrated uh, really, really helped um, change and shift the culture um, and make it more an open, a fun um, and a culture that people, individuals weren't concerned about, um, you know, stepping up and, you know, being shot down. But individuals uh, and a lot of our staff members are very happy to, um, you know, they'll throw up an idea and if it's no good, we'll discuss it and back we go again to the drawing board. And they take that on board. So the cultural shift um, was absolutely um, planned and also successfully implemented. They're not feeling constrained by uh, traditional ways of working. They have the opportunity to think of new ideas and new innovations and actually it gets listened to. It isn't seen as something that's too hard and too difficult to put a new idea in. If you think it's worthwhile and you think it's effective, put a, put a case together, build, um, uh, build the support for it and we'll look to uh, engage and work with you. There's a set of initiatives, um, so five key initiatives for the business to focus on throughout the year ahead, throughout the next business plan, and uh, they're allocated to different sponsors in the leadership team, but the working group that actually enables them, they're driven from the ground up. So whilst we sponsor and support them at a leadership level and remove any blocks that need to be kind of removed along the way, they're actually delivered by the people within the business who uh, know the impact that that has on the business day to day and what's needed to make them work. By having a centre of excellence and project management teams, each being professionals and each doing their own role, we've really seen the, um, the teams that come forward in terms of they hold each other to account. They might have service level agreements and um, um, measures that they have to perform and provide a service uh, and to deliver the work. But um, it goes beyond that now. So the, the culture is one that, um, you know, people feel pride in what they do. They're professionals in what they do. And um, they really do expect each other to perform. It's definitely a team effort, both um, internally within the BSI team and even uh, further outfield with all the delivery management and all of our contractors and designers. Because it's for the good of everybody that we see the whole team come together. So if one particular contractor has got an, uh, an idea or has been performing well in one particular area, there's an open channel of engagement and communication that happened between these teams. And this also you know, brings itself out into recently, um, uh, contractors were actually sharing equipment so one that needed a, a crane for a particular job, um, they reached out and were offered a crane by a contractor from a, a different project. And that's pretty unusual to get these, you know, typically they're competing against each other. But in this environment, the team were recognising that, you know, it's not the crane sitting there on their side doing nothing, so they might as well lend it to this other contractor so they can use it and to continue with their project. And that's fantastic to get teams that are normally competing against each other 
to really having that passion and desire to, to help out and recognize it. If the whole framework does well, everyone does well. And from my perspective, that is an innovation. That is something that we have created within Sydney Water that I have not actually seen within the industry anywhere else, that you actually do have competing bodies clearly being able to uh, share in an open and honest manner um, and interested in everybody's, um, I guess, performance and everybody's achievements um, as a whole as opposed to looking at just the me. To me, that was, would probably be the greatest innovation that we've actually achieved uh, within delivery management. So I think through the development of the framework over the five years, we've really seen the businesses reaping the benefits and rewards of, um, of us taking this new approach. And some of the value that we've seen generated has been, you know, we've been really proud of, really phenomenal. Um, whether it's from um, looking at the overall cost efficiency, so we've seen ourselves um, uh, being 15% more cost efficient. So, um, you know, it's taking the um some of the complexity out of the uh, tendering process for the contractors which means they're able to give us more um uh, sharper pricing but equally because they have surety of work um they operate on this regional yours to lose basis that means that if they they understand if they're doing well they're delivering well they have a continuity of work and that continuity of work again makes themselves more efficient being more efficient means a, 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 a less cost business to operate and those savings are passed on to us in terms of our delivery, which in turn is passed on to our customers. So they've seen lower customer bills as a result of us being 15% more efficient. We've also seen ourselves being um, three times more efficient in terms of what the team are able to output. So the size of the, uh, the PMO is the same um, as it was six years ago. So we've gone from delivering 250 million a year with a team of around 200 to delivering 700 million a year with a team of 200. So we've tripled our output without any appreciable increase in, in terms of the headcount. And this has all been about um, more re well redefined processes, professionals doing a professional job uh, and an environment that proactively engages uh, and encourages and rewards integration and cooperation. You know, like customer delivery, for example, and that was um, that was one of our massive challenges as well. Um, it was a group that um, never kind of like um, you know believed. Uh, within delivery management being the deliverer of choice um, and the journey that we went through with them uh, and it was you know their I guess higher management actually acknowledging that you know hold on a second we are delivering the program to cost and to time for the first time nearly ever uh, in Sydney Waters history massive turning point so yeah, absolutely. The, the amount of work that's coming on this business is doubling in the next few years and will maintain for the next 20 years. So having a very efficient, effective delivery partner that can respond to the changing uh, environment for Sydney and, uh, and helps us uh, deliver all the assets we need to in time uh, so that uh, people's homes can be built at the right time, the population can be supported uh, and is not held up by infrastructure. In fact, it's, it's supported by uh, you know, good value, quality infrastructure. It's there on time and it's trusted. Uh, this model is what's helping us do that. And without this model, we couldn't do that. No matter how the expansion is working at the moment, we've got a, a, a model uh, and a team that is able to generate better value and greater value to the greater Sydney region um, through its engagement with the supply chain, through its reach out to, uh, to the customers and being able to, you know, we're really looking at the legacy that this is going to be able to provide as a new way of undertaking infrastructure delivery through, um, through Australia.